Catholic. Uh, shortly after the war, he went to his priest and said, Father, forgive me, I've sinned. Uh, I've been, I kept a, a refugee hidden in my attic during the war. And uh, the priest said, well, that, that was, that's nothing you have to confess. That's a good thing. You, you probably rescued him in doing that. And the man said, yeah, well, I charged him 20 guilders a week to stay there. And uh, the priest said, well, you know, that wasn't a good thing, but it's still good that you let him stay in your attic. And the man said, oh, thank you. I'm so relieved. This has bothered me so much. Just, just one more thing. Do I have to let him know that the war is over? And <laughs> You know, Mark Twain once said, Having spent considerable time with good people, I can understand why Jesus liked to be with tax collectors and sinners. Because um, a lot of times what is, is, is taken for good is not the greatest in the world. We, we live in a time and in a culture that doesn't talk a whole lot about sin. Um, we don't even hear the word very often. And when we do... Uh, it is often portrayed as harmless at best or at worst. <laughs> um, you know, we uh, people get a little bit drunk and they just talk about the fact that they drink a little bit too much or uh, tell inappropriate jokes and it's just an off-color joke or they're deceptive and it's just a wh little white lie or greed is often masked as drive and the desire to be at your best and get ahead. Confidence, uh, arrogance we call confidence. Um, I heard someone on a sports talk radio show this past week who, who made the statement, you know, it's not trash talk if you can back it up. Same kind of thing is it's not bragging if you can back it up. You know, it's just, just kind of harmless and, and sometimes even better than harmless, you know. Sometimes people think of sin as being kind of... Uh, something that enhances life. Um, you know, if you, if you live together before you get married, then you can kind of try to decide whether you really should be together or not, right? Of course, what our culture never tells people is that when you live together before you get married, you double your divorce rate uh, if you ever do get married. Uh, or, you know, we kind of um, uh, see materialism often as a good thing. Uh, um, Greed is, is just drive. We live in a culture that doesn't have much problem with sin. It, it is at least often seen as harmless, sometimes even seen as advantageous. The Bible has such a drastically different view of sin. Just a couple of passages of Scripture. In James, we read these words. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. But each person's tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Now look at this digression here. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. That doesn't sound like something harmless or advantageous, does it? Romans 6, 23, we read these words. The wages, what is earned by sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Matthew, Jesus, Jesus said these things. Uh, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, or in the NIV it says if it causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or feet and be thrown into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble or sin, gouge it out. And throw it. That's pretty drastic, isn't it? If it causes you to sin, gouge out your own eye and throw it away. Better to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the lake of fire. What a drastically different view. I wonder which one's right. I mean, that's something we all have to figure out, right? Back in the winter, I talked a little bit, a couple of messages referred to the book of Judges. The book of Judges is the seventh book in the Bible. And uh, in the book of Judges, what basically has taken place is Moses led the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt through the wilderness. That nation has been established. They've received the law. They really have received all kind of instruction. Joshua then leads them into the promised land. The fifth book in the uh, Bible is Joshua. Is that right? 
sixth book is Joshua, uh, in the conquest of the land. And then we have the book of Judges uh, that really takes place over a period of about 330 years, starting in 1330 B.C., where the nation of Israel has no king, um, but they do have law. It's really interesting. This is something that we don't think about a lot of times. Uh, 1,300 years before Christ, where you had this nation not being ruled by uh, a king, but ruled by the law of God. And uh, the 12 tribes of Israel were really kind of a loose confederation, often acting on their own, often acting together. And throughout this period, God would raise up these judges, which is why the book is given its name, to, to lead Israel, uh, sometimes to instruct Israel, sometimes to, uh, to rescue Israel. And um, the problem that Israel had was they didn't like to be told what to do. Can you imagine anybody not liking to be told what to do? You know, they had the law, but they didn't have a king, a person to enforce it. And so they kept wandering away from the law because they didn't like to be told what to do. I heard about two guys who had each been married, married about the same time they were in each other's weddings. It had been about two years since their weddings, since they had seen each other. They ran into each other, got to talk a little bit, and after they had caught up a moment, one guy said, well, tell me, how's this married thing going for you? And the guy said, terrible. It's terrible. There is just no peace, and she wants to control everything. How's it going for you? The other guy said, it's great. I love it. It's just wonderful. You know, we, we had an agreement when we got married that as the husband, I would make all the big decisions, and as the wife, she would handle all the small decisions. And so far, we haven't had any big decisions. Now, you can turn that any way you want to because we just really love being in control, don't we? You know, we really, it's our, it is our nature, our fallen nature, not to really want anybody else to tell us what to do. And that's the way Israel was. They didn't like to be told what to do. And so in the book of Judges, we have this cycle taking place over and over again. Disobedience to God and His law and following the disobedience always, there is disaster. Usually in the form of being conquered by one of the nations around them. And then they cry out to God, and He delivers them. And, you know, maybe sometimes they'll follow God for a period of time. Maybe even the rest of that generation will follow God. But the same cycle, disobedience, disaster, deliverance. You know, whether you believe in God or not, you know that sometimes you have disobeyed either your parents or somebody in authority in your life or your own conscience. The Bible says all have sinned. And uh, we have this thing in us that, that just, unless it's redeemed, that says, I want to do things my way. And I really don't like to be told what to do. Now, back in February, I shared a little bit about the last story in the book of Judges. Because really in, in Judges what you see is this cumulative effect of sin in the life of this nation. And you remember this Levite, one of the priestly tribe of Israel, is traveling with his concubine, kind of a legal arrangement that was not marriage. And they go into this other city. They avoided spending the night in a a uh, Gentile city went to a Jewish city, and during the night, after they've been taken into a man's home, the men of the town come together, pounding on the door, bring this guest out so that we can have sex with him. And the host says, don't do this vile thing, and offers to send out his own daughter and the man's concubine. That was really gracious of him, wasn't it? And uh, eventually they send the concubine out. She's raped all night. When he comes out, she is dead takes her body on his donkey back to his home, and he's outraged, writes a letter to all the tribes of Israel to express his outrage, and maybe decides that's not going to be enough to get a result in this day and age. And so he actually cuts her body into 12 pieces and sends the parts of the body, and when the leaders of each tribe go out to get the morning mail, 
which are part of this body along with the explanation and the people of Israel are disturbed enough to go to war against one of their own tribes and almost annihilate it and this strange bizarre story that we have at the end of the book of Judges that really doesn't show anything redeeming or even any great lesson ends the book with these words in Judges 21 in those days there was no king in Israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes this book ends with this story that's kind of a cross between Halloween 4 and deliverance you know it's one you you don't tell your your kids as a bedtime story when you tuck them in at night but it also ends with kind of the essence of what sin is all about everyone did what was right in their own eyes and we end up with where that takes us when we do that. Because the essence of sin is I, I want my own way. Nobody, nobody had to teach us to want our own way, did they? You know, every two-year-old demonstrates that natural ability. Uh, Mike Bro tells about when his daughter Jody was two years old, they uh, were at his parents' house and they had a stairway and they were constantly trying to keep her off the stairway so he had told her three times, stay off the stairs. Once again, he looked and there she was walking up the stairway. She said, he said, Jody, I'm not going to tell you again. This two-year-old wheeled around with her hand on her hip and said, don't worry about it, big daddy. You know? I mean, it just kind of comes naturally to us, doesn't it? It's not just two-year-olds. There's not something that changes us that's, that is in us. This desire to do what I want, when I want to do it, with whoever I want to do it. Of course, we say as long as nobody gets hurt. And it always hurts somebody, doesn't it? That's the nature, that's the nature of sin. Sin always hurts the people around us, the people who care about us. always hurts us. Hurts future generations. The idea of sin not hurting anybody else is a myth. See, sin destroys relationships because it always focuses on putting me first. And so it's sin that causes marriages to be torn up and friendships severed and churches to split and families to be alienated. It's always good to ask ourselves, I think, how much do we like... How much do we enjoy selfishness in other people? And how much, much do we look at that as a quality in somebody we want to be connected with? We never like selfishness in other people. So we kind of have this problem. We all need relationships. And we all need to love and be loved. But sin is always a barrier to that. And of course, sin brings all those things that destroy relationships like envy and deception and gossip and lying and unfaithfulness and stealing, rebellion. And most people, and I think this is important at this time of year because, you know, the school year is starting back and it's kind of like a, a new phase in the year. Everybody's starting things up new again. And our tendency when we do that is in one way we decide how we're going to approach things is we look around and see what everybody else is doing, right? When we do that too much of our, with our lives, we, we get in trouble. Um, Andy Stanley says, asks the question, do you really want to be like everybody else? Because everybody else, the collective everybody else, kind of trying to live their lives like a beer commercial. You know, where everybody is always happy and smiling all the time and surrounded by beautiful people, always sunny with an exciting night ahead, plenty of money, no worries, nobody gets sick, nobody's in counseling, nobody's struggling with substance abuse, no problems, no worries. You know, that's kind of the image, right? Just one problem with that. That's not real life, is it? You know, the reality is everybody else is worried and fearful and in debt, 
unable to enjoy what they have because they're always focused on what they don't have. Everybody else, for the most part, drinks too much and medicates too much and constantly trying to produce, manufacture happiness. Single women are worried they're always going to be single. Single men are wondering what's the point of getting married anyway. You have all the benefits without getting married. But always wondering if they're going to find that perfect woman who will just stay perfect, not change, <laughs> after you really get to know them. Married women are hoping their husbands will be faithful and married women, men wondering if they should be faithful and most people living with lots of regrets and a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Students living for what people around them think even though those people won't even be in their life anymore in a few years. And college students wondering if they're going to find a job in this economy when they get out. I mean, there's an image and there's reality. And they're very different. And so many people look around them to see what's everybody else doing. And that's what Israel did. See, they looked around them at the nations that surrounded them. And they thought at times, well, that nation looks powerful and affluent. And you know, they have a different God for every problem they come up against. Help them out with their crops. Help them have children. Help them manage their money. Help them get through drought. And the worship of a lot of those gods around them, quite honestly, involved temple prostitution. That looked good at times. They looked around them to see what everybody else was like. Just remind you, you've heard me say this before if you've been here. When we compare ourselves to other people, we're always comparing ourselves to their highlight reels. Right? Because people are always putting their best first. And what gets our attention in them is always their strong points. It's, it's always their highlight reels. You know, it's that image again. Everything looks good. But unless we know them well, we don't see the low lights, do we? And it's amazing how often people will really look at someone and think, that's what I want to be like. And they don't know that that person's in counseling and they're about to be in rehab for a year and they're shouting at each other in their house and their relationship with their kids is terrible but everything looks okay on the outside and so they keep getting their cues from each other. You know, when we choose to do whatever we want, whenever we want, with whoever we want, as long as nobody gets hurt, we end up like everybody else. Andy Stanley, again, tells about uh, when his son was in the eighth grade, one of his friends invited him to spend the night with him, and their family was going to this fundraiser, and they wanted their son to have somebody with him at this fundraiser and ask if he could go and then, and then spend the night with his friend. And when he got home the next day, his dad asked him, well, how was it? He said, oh, Dad, it was terrible. It was terrible. Everybody was drinking. You know, well, yeah, you do that at a fundraiser to give people to give, right? <laughs> it's always alcohol. Uh, we don't have that advantage in the church. You know, we don't have an open bar. If we did, <laughs> if we did, I wouldn't have to be nearly as well prepared and you'd still think I was really funny and really smart. <laughs> and he said, and dad, dad, they danced. He said, yeah, yeah, when adults drink a little bit, they think they can dance. And the son said, dad, adults should not dance. Bad things happen. When, <laughs> when we do what we want, when we want, with whoever we want, bad things happen and people get hurt. And Israel looked at the kingdoms around them and they looked good. You know, Joshua, after he had led the people, in the people in the, into Israel, he had said to them and had them covenant with him to follow after the Lord. In Joshua 24, he had said, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Throw away the idols. And, of course, they all said, We'll follow the Lord. It's the Lord who delivered us. And, you know, to not let that book be too discouraging with, to you, it does say that generation 
followed the Lord. But then another generation came up that didn't know all the things that God had done. And by chapter 2 of the book of Judges, they're wanting to be like one of the nations near them. And so, God allows that nation to conquer them. And they're ruled by that other king for eight years. You know, what, how, how typical that is. When there's something that we want other than God. You know, that freedom to just do what we want, when we want, with whoever we want. That sin that looks so good, isn't it amazing how often we end up conquered by it and dominated by it? That's exactly what happened to Israel. Now it's an important thing to know how often this happens in Romans chapter 1. We get just this really profound description of a descent into sin. And over and over again, we see what the people wanted, and so God gave them what they wanted. And they went further and further into bondage, and further and further into corruption and disillusion. Because the nature of, of the beings we are, as creatures is this, we, we will be ruled by something or someone. And when the people of Israel no longer wanted to be ruled by God, they ended up ruled by the kings around them. And when we don't want to be ruled by God, we'll be ruled by something else. You know, one of the most destructive illusions in life is that we can rule ourselves. Right? Just this idea that we'll be our own ruler, our own king, our own God. But it's the kind of creature that we are that we will always be ruled by something. 